For all the latest news in North Central Washington, go to ncwlife.com or find us on Facebook. Got a news tip? Email us at news at ncwlife.com or call 888-2020. Welcome to a special edition of the NCW Life magazine. Pibus University, where learning is a lifelong adventure. The Pibus Public Market is pleased to offer a series of unique and fun classes for the Wenatchee Valley community. Classes are taught by local volunteers with an interest and aptitude in the subjects that they teach. Well, first I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself. I've been an entomologist for 36 years. Insects took me under their wing and showed me my life work. And, it, and so I've been, been doing that for that period of time. So what I would like to, and if you would like to interrupt me and ask questions, I'm perfectly happy with that. You won't ruin my train of thought because I don't have one. So everything will be just fine. So I thought what I'd do first is talk a little bit about honeybees and colony collapse disorder because I think people are really interested in what's going on with the honeybee populations. And then let you know that honeybees are not native. They're introduced, they were introduced with the uh, Settlers in the 1600s, they brought them over because they, needed, they wanted a nice sugar source and beeswax, and so they thought this was a good way to bring that to them and um, not have to rely on native bees, which don't produce that kind of um, sugary substance uh, for a colony that persists over the winter time. So, okay, so colony collapse disorder. So it's a it's a very, very large problem, and there's many, many factors that are affecting honeybees. And so I wanted to make that um, clear to everybody, hopefully, because a lot of people think that, well, maybe if we just solve this one issue, then the honeybee populations will rebound, and that's probably not going to be the case. So I want to give you an idea of what the honeybee populations are suffering with and uh, persisting with to um, try to maintain a population. So the first group are parasites. So there's the varroa mites, which are external parasites, as you can see, and you can see the, too bad if I had a pointer, but can you see the little mites on the thorax, the back of the honeybee? And so they ride on the honeybee and they actually um, uh, take uh, nutrients and uh, weaken the bee. And then when they get to the hive, the uh, varroa mites will all, often uh, move off of the adults and then move on to the larvae and feed on the larvae. So that's a problem. Another group are the tracheal mites. These are the breathing tubes of insects, and you can see the little tracheal mites um, inside of the, the, the breathing tubes in the trachea. And so they're also feeding on the insect and on the bee and also causing problems and reducing their um, ability to survive and to forage and to maintain the population. So those are two problems. And then there's a little fly, a forward fly, if you can see it on the back of the honeybee and it actually lays its egg on the honeybee. The egg, uh, the egg hatches and then the larvae bores into the, the bee and works its way through the nervous system and it basically disrupts the nervous system and they become like zombies. So they call them zombie bees. So. And then there's a host of diseases. There's protozoan diseases. There's Nosema sereni and Nosema, Nosema apis that bees have to deal with. There's um, fowl brood, and if you look at over here on your right, you can see the, the um, cells and how they dipped a, a small stick into that cell, and it just looks like soup where there used to be a larvae, so the bacteria completely consumes the larvae and, and just leaves that. And then chalk brood is a fungus, and you can see the cells are filled with this. Uh, the larvae are overcome with the fungus, and they just look like little pieces of chalk in the cell. So this is also something that the honeybees have to deal with. Uh, there's chronic paralysis virus. There's Israeli acute paralysis virus and deformed wing virus. So there's uh, fungal diseases, protozoan diseases, viral diseases that are all attacking the, the, the honeybees. Nutrition is another issue with the honeybees. Um, Basically, the way we use honeybees, oftentimes they're not able to expose themselves to a diversity of pollen and nectar. And so it's somewhat like um, eating at McDonald's every day, and you know how, how that would affect your immune system and, and, your, and uh, uh, your health. So, And then habitat is another issue. Um, we've lost a lot of our 
uh, ditch banks, fence lines, field borders, and habitats that honeybees use for foraging. Um, are any of you familiar with Roundup Ready crops? So Roundup is these crops are uh, developed so that you can spray Roundup on them and then that eliminates all the weeds so you don't have to do a lot of cultivation and other types of weed control. The problem is the Roundup drifts off of the fields, gets into the ditches and areas like that and kills a lot of the flowers and stuff that would be available for the bees to pick up pollen and nectar from. So, so that's one of the issues also, especially in the Midwest where they're growing a lot of corn and soybeans, which are uh, um, mainly GMO um, crops in that, those particular areas. So. And then colony stress. Um, with honeybees, they put them on a flat bed, large numbers of bees, drop them off at an orchard. They stay there maybe seven to ten days or two weeks at the most. They can pick up pollen and nectar from that point, but as soon as the um, orchard is no longer in bloom, they pack them all up, put them on a flat bed, and they move them about a hundred miles and then drop them off again, and they have to go through the whole process again. And so I liken that to me having to start my home over pack up my kids, all of my belongings, move 100 miles, set it all down again, start all over again, and then in about two weeks get picked up again and moved. And so they'll run, uh, this process will go on from early spring to mid-summer, and then they'll work their way back uh, to the places where they may be um, uh, raising the bees. So there's that constant movement and, and uh, disruption of the population. So. And then there's pesticides, uh, herbicides. Not, they don't really necessarily affect the bee um, as far as uh, creating instant mortality of the bee. But what they do do is eliminate a lot of the flowers and plants that the, the honeybees rely on for pollen and nectar. And it reduces the um, diversity of pollen and nectar available for the, the population. So insecticides, have you, um, any of you heard of people talk about neonicotinoids? Yeah, um, they're being used a lot in uh, nurseries and um, areas, places where people buy plants, and they're systemic, so p you can understand why people would use them because you apply this material to the seed, it's expressed throughout the plant. So when you buy a plant from Home Depot or someplace like that, um, you want a nice clean plant, you, want, you don't want to bring pests to your garden and your home, and so this is one way of ensuring that the, there are no pests but unfortunately, that insecticide is still in the plant, and it is also in expressed in the pollen. So the bees are picking that up, and it's affecting their behavior. So it, it affects their, dis disrupts their mobility, uh, their ability to navigate, their ability to return to the hive, and, uh, fo and their foraging activities. And so what happens is uh, groups of individuals go out, workers go out, and they can't get back to the hive, and so they just keep sending more and more workers to the, to the hive, or out of the hive and into the field, and then they never come back. And so eventually there's not enough workers to maintain the colony. So those are the factors that are affecting the honeybees, so. Yeah, she's asking if, the neo, if, if you bought a plant, it produced a seed, yeah, the neonicotinoid would also be expressed in that seed, and so when you planted it, it would reseed itself. And whether that level would be, uh, a level high enough to cause any kind of um, mortality or uh, reduce the survivability of the bees. I don't know that people have looked at it in that fashion. So, Get the fastest internet available in North Central Washington by switching to Localtel and get speeds up to 1,000 meg. Call 888-8888 today or go online to localtel.net. So I thought what I'd do tonight is first introduce the order, an order of insects, they're called the Hymenoptera, which are the bees, wasps, uh, sawflies, and ants. And the reason I want to do this is a lot of times people confuse wasps with bees, and people have a lot of fear of being stung. And a lot of times it's really yellow jackets and bald-faced hornets that are the issue because they're social wasps, and they can sting multiple times and they can come out in mass because they have what's called a aggregation pheromone or alarm pheromone and when one of them feels like the hive is being threatened the rest of them come out to to um, to try to uh, eliminate the the problem and so what I did tonight is I wore my bald face hornet ensemble for you guys so. <laughs> So 
So the, the hymenopter are uh, uh, quite a large group of, uh, of insects. And the reason that they're called the hymenopter is that the front wings and hind wings have the, have, uh, the front wing has a channel and the hind wings have hooks, like little crochet hooks. And they can actually uh, lock those hooks into this channel. And so when they're in flight, they have a larger area for, for, for movement and flight. And then if you're uh, moving around in the flowers, you, wanna be able, you don't want to have your wings banging into the, the anthers and, and the flower parts. And so you can unhook those wings and then fold them over your back. And then you can walk around and not have to worry about damaging your wings. So. So the first group are, I wanted to uh, show you the difference of, are the sawflies and the bees, wasp, and ants. So sawflies are part of the order Hymenoptera. And they tend, if you look at that, they, their abdomen is attached broadly to the thorax. And with the bees, wasp, and ants, there's a constriction between the abdomen and the thorax. It's a small stalk or a petiole. And so that's uh, one way of telling the, the difference between that particular group. The, the sawflies all feed on, on the plants or in plants. And I like to compare them to, remember when we were young and we had kind of a nice waist? And then as we've gotten older, it gets a little bit broader and broader. That's the sawflies. They've, they've aged and have a broader waist. So, so have any of you run into the, this individual in the forest? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a type of sawfly. Uh, they call them stump jumpers, and sometimes they use other terms for them. But they lay their eggs in wood, and so then the larvae feeds inside of the wood. And they're really important in the forest because they come in after fires and places like that, and they help to break down the wood and create organic matter for the forest. Are those ones you can hear? You can, sometimes you can hear something gnawing away. In the it, wood. It, it could very well be that, or maybe um, um, a beetle larva that's in the wood also. So this uh, device at the end of their abdomen is called an ovipositor or egg laying device. And it has not been modified as a stinger. So it can actually sting. But it has a long enough ovipositor that it does tend to scare people when they see them in the forest. And then the, this is the immature stage or the larvae. And they look like um, the caterpillars of butterflies and moths. So they have a. A, a large number of pseudo legs on the abdomen, but they don't have little tiny hooks on them like the, uh, the moths and butterflies do, and they have uh, more pro legs than the moths and butterflies. But you can see them feeding on the leaf. Most of them are leaf feeders, but there's like the wheat stem sawfly that actually feeds inside of the stem of wheat and causes the stem to weaken and, and lodge so that you can't harvest the, the crop. The next group are the parasitic wasp. And these are their egg laying device here and over here. And again, their ovipositor has not been um, modified as a stinger. And so this little, see how acrobatic this little individual is? It, she's actually laying eggs inside of that aphid. And so she'll drive an egg, or she'll drive her ovipositor in the egg. She'll lay an egg inside of there. The egg will hatch. And then the larvae will feed inside of the aphid. And while it's feeding, it'll actually glue the aphid to the plant surface so it doesn't fall off, because that wouldn't be good for the larva. And then see this little tan basketball there? That's a parasitized aphid. So if you ever uh, have an aphid colony or an aphid uh, infestation, and you start seeing these little brown uh, basketballs, those are parasitized aphids. And wouldn't you be, love to be as acrobatic as she is, to be able to, to curl your abdomen around like that? So. And these are very, very important insects. There, many of them are quite small. And so a lot of people don't see them. And like I said, they, they can't sting because the ovipositor hasn't been modified as a stinger. So they're just using it as an egg laying device. So yes? Is there Are you talking about orucids? Yeah, there, there's a group that make the transition between sawflies and parasitic wasps that are uh, considered the evolutionary uh, progenitors of the parasitic wasps. So, yeah, there is some of that. So, 
Um, let's see. And so we're, we consider these actually quite beneficial because they generally attack insects that we have deemed uh, pests. So, but like I said, they're small, and a lot of times people overlook these particular individuals. Okay, so the, this group, the wasps, now have uh, modified their stinger or their uh, ovipositor into a stinger, and so they can inject venom. And the reason they do that is to protect themselves and also to immobilize their prey. Because has anybody tried to eat food when it moves in your mouth? It's not, it's not very appetizing. So that you want stuff to be still. And so this is a way of, of uh, making sure that the food doesn't move around. So you can see here's a little tiny uh, wasp carrying its prey. And so what they, they use mo mainly insects and, and spiders as prey. And uh, they will take an individual uh, build a nest for their larvae and then put the individual prey in that nest and then they'll lay an egg and then the egg will hatch and then the larvae will feed on that and develop. So, so you, this is called a velvet ant, this one in the middle. It's actually a wasp, although it looks more like an ant, but you, can you see its stinger? So some people uh, have labeled that as a cattle killer and I don't, it doesn't kill cattle, but I think the sting is so painful that you, I guess you want to die after you've been stung. But. And then uh, here's a, a little uh, solitary wasp attacking uh, a spider. They're called spider wasp, and they actually uh, will uh, move around. And, and you, you can imagine a spider's not real excited about being uh, in, in, uh, bent, immobilized with venom. And so it really tries to stay away from that. And so they do this dance between the spider and the wasp, and the wasp eventually has to get back um, behind the spider and then actually sting it and immobilize it and then um, lay its egg on it and then it hatches and feeds inside of it. And the spider's not actually dead, it's alive but it can't move so it's paralyzed. Oh yeah, yuck, huh? Oh, spider What's that? Does the spider ever yeah, they do actually. I've watched them. Uh, I've watched this happen on occasion. And despite, they usually don't kill the wasp, but they at least get away from the wasp. So they'll they'll do this dance, and, and it'll uh, scare off the wasp, and then it'll run and try to get to it. its a place where it can hide and where the wasp can't get to it. And so nobody does this on their days off. Just no. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so there's a solitary wasp and there's a social wasp. And these are probably the ones that most people have a problem with because they do um, produce a colony. And the difference between these and honeybees are one, they can sting multiple times. They can be very, very aggressive when they're protecting their colony. And only the queen overwinters. So the colony will build up during the season. And as the season, um, uh, food supply and the season gets cooler a lot of times they'll come in more competition with humans because their populations are higher and the food source is not as diverse and so people at, at picnics and places like that often will come in, uh, come in contact with them and get stung. Has anybody been stung by yellow jackets? Yeah, it's very painful, isn't it? Yeah, and they can actually bite and sting so they can uh, do both. And Yes, yeah, that would be a great place for, for them to build an yeah, wasp all over the place, yeah. Yeah, and generally what happens with the, they'll produce males in the fall, and then the males and the females will mate, and those will be the overwintering queens. They'll find a place to uh, spit, hibernate and spend the winter, and then they'll be out in the springtime, and then they'll have to start the colony anew. So she'll uh, go out, forage for, um, Oh, her prey, and then she'll lay eggs on on the on the um, lar the prey, and then the larvae will begin to develop. And then when they hatch, they'll become the workers, and then she'll stay in the colony and produce uh, eggs and and uh, and increase the size of the colony. So, so those are the yellow jackets and the bald-faced hornets. And they like to re if they're successful in an area, they'll return, so they'll come back. So. Um, oftentimes, I mean, if you are having problems with them, you might want to buy some of those little yellow traps and put them out early in the season. 
and tra trap out some of the queens and then they won't have a chance to develop a, a larger colony. And they, they are actually the solitary wasps and the um, um, social wasps, they do do some pollination. Ju they just have not developed the structures to uh, collect pollen as effectively as, as the bees do. Okay, so the bees, so the bees are different than the wasps in the sense that they, rather than using animal food, uh, insects and spiders and, and other organisms like that, they use plant material. So they're using pollen and nectar. So this is a complete changeover from uh, the food sources that the wasp use and they don't compete with the wasp for, for food. And they develop these incredible structures that allow them to collect the pollen. So they have uh, pollen baskets on their legs and they have these uh, hairs that are actually um, uh, in rows so that they can pack the pollen in the hairs. The other thing bet uh, different between bees and wasps is uh, wasps tend to be pretty hairless, but if they do have hairs, the hairs aren't, they don't, they're not branched. So if you look at this far uh, picture, you can see the hairs look like little tiny Christmas trees. And so the bees have that kind of branched hairs. And so that's one way you can tell bees from wasps. But you probably don't want to get that close and personal to a bee or wasp to find that out. So. <laughs> Usually you probably would want to put it in a refrigerator, slow it down, or freeze it, and then take a look at the at those structures. So, and the other thing that's interesting too, the oftentimes the pollen and the bees have a different charge, and so there's an electrostatic electrostatic attraction for the pollen. So that also helps them collect it. Have a fun video you'd like to see featured on NCW Life? Email us at newsphotos at ncwlife.com. Solitary bees, and here in the uh, Pacific Northwest, Don, is it over 400 species of bees? 600, so, 600 now? Yeah. And counting? Yeah, so there's over 600 species of bees. Uh, native bees and just in Washington, just in Washington. yeah around 4,000 in North and Don's I don't know if you, Don's working on bees he's putting together a guide to the bees of North Central Washington so so there's a very uh, knowledgeable individual if you have questions about bees also so so the what's that Thank you, Dr. oh you're welcome Don so the Mainly what we have are a large number of solitary bees, and a lot of them we don't know too much about as far as their biologies and exactly how many species we have here in Washington, we're not sure about. We really don't know exactly what's going on with their populations, whether they're uh, increasing or declining or staying steady or anything like that. We just don't have that kind of data. So. And that's pretty much the way it is throughout the North America. So wouldn't you say, Don, that Yeah. We're at the very beginning edge of learning about many species. And I would concur. We, there's so much to know. So, and it, it'll provide, a, for me, a lifetime of opportunity to go out and, and learn more about bees. So, so the solitary bees are individuals where the, the female has to do all of the work herself. And so she has to collect pollen and nectar. She's going to find a, a cell to put the pollen and nectar in and then uh, lay an egg and then the larvae will feed on that pollen and nectar and develop. Usually, oftentimes the larvae is the stage of development that overwinters and the, and the, um, the uh, uh, bee will, the adult will be gone. She won't survive. So. So uh, I, I don't, we're, we're going to have a quiz after this. I'm going to ask you if you can identify these families of bees by these characteristics. So, No, I'm just kidding. So I just wanted to show you what Don and I have to look at to try to identify these bees just a family. So, and these are the Andrenids, and they have two subantennal sutures. <laughs> so I know you can just see those, can't you? They're really difficult to see even uh, on the bees when, when you have them under a microscope. So, 
But that's the characteristic we look at for andrenids. So, and they're short-tongued bees, so they actually uh, can only uh, pick up pollen and nectar from uh, a very, very short source flowers, you know, that aren't, aren't very long. So. And about, Don, when you say about 70% of the solitary bees are, are ground nesters, somewhere yeah, in that neighbor? 70%. Yeah, so, so there's a, a large number of them that nest in the soil and need that kind of a habitat to, to be successful in their uh, um, population development and also uh, the, the survival of their, their larvae. These are the colletids, and I like these. Uh, we uh, sometimes call them the clown bees because of the markings on the face. And then there's the plaster bees, and they actually produce a um, cellophane-like material that they line their cells with so that it helps to keep disease and water from getting into the cell and, and, and disrupting or destroying the larvae. So, so they're the first ones to develop cellophane way before humans did. Insects are way ahead of of us as far as that production. And then the halictids are, these might be a little bit more uh, identifiable because of the, some of them are very, very attractive, like this one right here is a metallic green. Have you seen those bees? Yeah, they're pretty, they're fairly common and they're very beautiful. And sometimes we refer to them as sweat bees because these will be the bees that will come along and kind of land on your arm. And basically they're looking for a little bit of um, moisture and, uh, and some of the minerals that are associated with your sweat. And so they're not really looking at an opportunity to feed on you or sting you. So have, have any of you been stung by a, a small little solitary bee? <laughs> Lisa, how, how bad is that? Yeah. Don, have you, I know you have. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And, and I've been stung too. And the small ones just kind of feel like a prick. I mean, there's, uh, if they've injected any venom, then you can get a reaction for the venom. But as far as the pain. It's important to know that they don't sting out of malice. They only sting when they're whacked or pushed. Yeah. Them. So if you got them on you and you just blow them off, you'll never get hurt. But if you happen to run against them or crush them down, yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah. And so these, what I, I guess what we're trying to get across, is these bees are quite beautiful. They're very, very important as pollinators. And as far as the fear factor, it's, it's a very, very low fear factor compared to uh, yellow jackets and bald-faced hornets and, and, uh, and that group. And then there's, now we're moving into long-tongue bees. And these are the megachylids. And these are the leaf-cutting and mason bees. And so they actually um, uh, develop cells above ground, and they use things like um, oh, um, hollow stems. And also, uh, you can buy these little bee boards where they can actually nest inside of those. And like a, they have a little bit long, they have a longer tongue. This one's a very, very beautiful one. Is Osmia over on our on your left? And then these bees collect their pollen a lot different than many of the other ones. Their uh, pollen basket and hairs are on the underside of their abdomen. And you can see the, on the right, there's one that's got the uh, abdomen packed with pollen. So, and I brought a, an example of some of these uh, bee boards and also the little cells and stuff if you'd like to look at them. They're, they're little like cardboard uh, cells and then you have little paper containers that you slip in them. And so you can actually rear these mason bees. And, and they're beginning to look at these for pollination with cl colony collapse disorder. People are beginning to say maybe we need to look at a more diverse um, um, species of bees for pollination. And these are a group that have potential for pollination. They're much more efficient at pollinating than the honeybees. It takes about 250 bees per acre as compared to you know, several thousand for honeybees. So they're good. And they also forage at uh, um, Cooler temperatures, so. Are these bees social? What's that? Are they social? Or no, these are still solitary. Yeah, so they'll nest, you know, but each individual will have, well, she could have multiple cells, but 
there's not going to be like three or four uh, individuals in one of those cells. Just one female is going to do one, one cell. So, but you could have multiple females in a board. So. So you're asking about where the hum bumblebees for Yeah, they're pretty secretive. It can be very difficult to find a nest. I, have, I think I've run into one in all the times I've been out. Yeah. You can actually, people have actually built these little nests for the bumblebees and they'll try to capture a queen and they'll have um, Oh, like felt pad and padding and stuff like that that they can use for uh, kind of nesting material and they can start a colony. But generally, out in the wild, you'll find them possibly in an old rodent's um, hole that's abandoned or under a wood pile. Sometimes they'll be down into those areas or underneath a rock or um, people um, in a wood pile and down in below the wood pile and down in the soil. Don, have you, I don't run into, I just haven't seen bumblebee nests all that often. You just and 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 they need habitat and they'll find it. Okay. You know the main thing I think for individuals, if you want to encourage uh, pollinators, is to to um, maybe take out some lawn and put in some flowers. You know. Yeah, no, those will be great because the bees really need a source of pollen and nectar throughout their life cycle, and honeybees need it for a much longer period of time because they're building up you know, actually food for the winter so that they can survive. They're not actually making the honey for us. I know that's hard to imagine, but <laughs> so, so, yes. Uh, evolutionarily speaking, the Coleoptera were some of the original. Yeah. Right? Yes, that's and, true. And then also, I, I just a thought, uh, moths, I wonder if they may be uh, more beneficial in, in the future because of the attraction to light. Maybe they can offset some of the Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting point. I don't know. That's a good, yeah, I don't know what to say on that, but you're absolutely right. Don, did you? Yeah, when you're talking about bumblebees and nests, it's, it's helpful to know that some of the bumblebees will fly as far as seven miles from the nest and bring home a load of pollen. Honeybees will fly as far as four miles from a hive and bring home the pollen. So you may have bumblebees in your yard Don brought up a really good point because the other thing is with these solitary bees, they don't fly very far away. So they, you know, they they have to have a nest pretty close to where they're picking up the pollen and nectar. You know, I, Don, maybe a quarter mile would that'd be a long flight for some of these. Some of the swept bees, 50 feet or less. Yeah, it's yeah, like it's incredible. So trying to provide habitat for them is very very important, and if they're going to nest in the soil, they're going to have to have that kind of conditions also. And so a, a lawn is just not going to provide those kind of conditions, nor is it going to provide the pollen and nectar that, the, that these bees need for survival. And so that's one of the things we're trying to encourage is that if you can, take out a portion of your lawn and put in flowers. If everybody put in flowers, the, the pollinator populations would be in much better shape. So, Yes, Patty. Oh, that's, I haven't seen that yeah, yet, Patty. It shows um, honeybees, moths, butterflies, and Yeah. And Patty brought up a good point. Xerxes Society, if you're really interested in finding out more about bees, that website is phenomenal. It's, it's Xerxes, X-E-R-C-E-S. And it's a nonprofit that's um, well. It's developed to um, promote the survival of invertebrates, and so they're working with uh, like dragonflies, monarch butterflies, and a lot of the bees. So, a lot of different insects. So, yes. Uh, I've seen what I think are leaf cutter bees in my yard because they were cutting leaves. What do they do with the leaves? So, so they they use those to make their cell. Where the, I forgot to mention that, where the mason bees use mud, like plaster, you know, and uh, brick mortar, and these guys use uh, uh, the leaves, and then they'll form a nice tube so that, that they can put their pollen and nectar in there and then lay an egg in there. So they aren't letting it ferment and eating it or anything like 
No, no, they're using it for their uh, cell. And um, you, if, well, you may see with your roses, sometimes you'll see a nice kind of circular cutout. That's probably a strawberry root weevil that's doing that. If it's more elliptical and elongated, it's probably a leaf cutter bee that's, that's cutting the, the leaf. So. And, and if you like that, I mean, if you can get the bees to do that, you can actually produce some pretty uh, um, um, beautiful leaves, you know, that they're cut out and everything and marginated. So. Yes? You mentioned that there were uh, as many as 600 species of bees in Washington State, many of which haven't been cataloged. Have, my question is, have they not been cataloged because the work hasn't been done or because new species are involved? Uh, mostly the work hasn't been done, yeah. Yeah, there, I mean, there's probably the possibility of that, but more, um, the best explanation would be we just don't know. So there's a, a lot of these bees are pretty tiny, and um, we just haven't had, we, there's just not enough people working on, on bees. So, Don, you, would you want to add to that? He was saying that, uh, is it because new bee species are evolving, or is it more that we just don't know what's out here? as far as species are concerned. Known as the unknown pollinators. I've done more bee collecting than anybody else in the state of Washington. In my first summer, I discovered a new bee. I'll probably discover more before I'm through. We just haven't looked. Look at the back of your hand. Come on, look at the back of your hand. Look at the back of your little fingernail. The parallel sides of your little fingernail are about 10 millimeters apart. Half of the bees in Washington, when they got their wings out as wide as they can reach, can't reach across your little fingernail. You've been yeah. looking at them all your life and not realizing you're looking at native bees. <laughs> We're just beginning to start asking who's out there and differentiate. And, and that's why I brought my collection, so you could get an idea of the various sizes of bees. And then Don has a, a flyer there that shows the smallest to the largest bee in Washington, and that would be real helpful. Yeah, I think a lot of us think that bees are just honeybees and bumblebees, and that's about it. But there's all of these other bees out here that are much smaller than them, and um, they don't have the population like bumblebees and honeybees do. So we don't come in, um, we're not aware of them, like Don's saying, and we don't come in as uh, great a contact with them as we do with the social bees. So, so I yes. I can only answer one. <laughs> no, just kidding. Is our environment and climate here in the valley conducive to having honeybee colonies and being able to have them winter, winter over? And then my second question would be, as you mentioned, they're non-native, but they've been here for hundreds of years at this point. Do we know what kind of impact the honeybees have had on the environment that they were introduced to? Yeah, that's a really, two good questions. One is that it, this is a great place for honeybees because of the wildflowers and the shrub step and the variation uh, in habitat that we have even around in this valley is pretty um, phenomenal. So this is really a great place, not only for honeybees, but also it's a, a good place for a diversity of native bees. And then your other question was, oh, how is that impact? That's a really good question. And I don't, we know that they're competing for pollen and nectar with the native bees and exactly what impact they're having on the native bee populations. I don't think we really have a good handle on that. And then the next group are the social bees, which are the honey and bumblebees. And the reason they're considered social is they have a distinct caste system, so you have, you have the workers, you have the queens, and then you have the males, which are the drones, and the drones really aren't all that important to the, to the hive other than they produce, they're sperm donors, and so once they donate their sperm, they get kicked out of the hive and they die. So if you don't contribute, you don't last in the hive, and so the males aren't treated very, very well. And there's a, uh, two examples here of the honeybees and bumblebees. And again, honeybees, you know, they have uh, the colony overwinters. 
but bumblebees, again, like the uh, social wasps, the yellow jackets and bald-faced hornets, only the queen survives and she has to start a new colony each, each uh, spring. So I like to encourage people to be very, very careful with the, f with the first bumblebees you see because most likely those are queens and you'd like to have them have the opportunity to establish a colony because they're such important pollinators. So. And just uh, some examples of honeybees. You can see the uh, pollen basket there at the top of the picture and the hairy eyes and then the colony and then a honeybee with a, a pack of pollen on its uh, hind leg. And there's approximately 40 species of bumblebees in North America. And one of them has just been uh, added to the endangered species list, the rusty patched bumblebee, Bombus affinis. So that's something new as far as uh, uh, bees are concerned that they have made the Endangered Species Act. And, and the pr problem that they're finding that this um, rusty patch bumblebee was found uh, pretty much throughout about 28 states. And right now they're only finding it in about 13 states and at very, very low numbers. So they're concerned that it may be um, going extinct. That's in, in North America, are you asking? Yeah, yeah, here in the United States. So. There are people out doing citizen science where they're trying to find out uh, how well distributed this particular bumblebee is. So um, one of the concerns with bumblebees are that they are very, very good at um, pollinating tomatoes in greenhouses. And so they've used them as buzz pollinators. So they'll, um, they vibrate their wings at about the um, same frequency as high C. And it blows the pollen off of the flowers and then it lands on the anthers and pollinates the tomatoes. But what happened is some of the bees that they were using uh, picked up a disease in the um, greenhouse and they're concerned that those bees have left those greenhouses and may be spreading some of that disease into the population. So nobody knows exactly what's going on with, with that, but people are, are aware of that could be a problem. So. And then I just wanted to mention there's other uh, orders of insects that are pollinators too, and a lot of times we may not think of them as such, but there's several flies that pollinate, and even beetles, and moths and butterflies, and even thrips can be a, a, a pollinator. They're not as efficient at bees, but they're still um, out there helping to move pollen around and uh, fertilize it. So, so that's my talk on, uh, on uh, reproductive sex and <laughs> and and the and the uh, individual that moves sex in the in uh, nature. Please join us weekly for the 12th District with yours truly, Carrie Condotta. Check your channel guide for times or go to ncwlife.com for details.